like a month. Boys ask me how I feel. Successful streak, touching them first mills. All my life, been grinding all my life. R.I.P. Nip. Man, you already know what it is. Jay Williams, let's live life. And we're back. I'm running on empty. Like, if I was a car right now, I would be putting. But I'm still getting from point A to point B. I'm getting on average about two and a half to three hours of sleep every single night. I'm getting home 2.30, 3 o'clock, 3.30. Then my alarm goes off at 6. And I'm getting back up. And I get ready for work. Some mornings I take my little boy to school. And then I'm back on these job sites till 3.30, 4 o'clock in the evening. And then I go home. Spend a little bit of time with my family. Talk with my wife. How was your day? Talk with my kids. How was school? Let me see your schoolwork. Help my son pronounce his words. Learn what he needs to learn. And then just like that, I'm back out the door. The last three nights have been spent refinishing my cabinets. I love a kitchen. A nice kitchen. Like, I'm big on the kitchen. I spent a lot of time in the kitchen. So we made sure with this kitchen that it would be everything we wanted. So I went yesterday and I got the hardware for the kitchen. We do a black and gold theme or like black and copper. So I got all the black hardware for the cabinets. I finished the, the final coat on the cabinets and all the doors, double sided the doors. Don't cut no corners. If you're going to do it, do it right. Got all the cabinets hung, all the hardware on. Very proud of it. It's beautiful. And we've got the Samsung refrigerator with the TV on it. That is ingenious. It's got all these apps. So I just click Discovery, put on the first 48. And as I'm in there working, I let the first 48 play. Listen, young man, I can tell you got something on your heart. You got something on your mind. Let it out. You're in pain. You're hurting right now. Now, you're really about to be hurting after they sent it your You're hurting right now. Let it out. Man, you're right. I did that. Come on. Come here. Give me a hug. Tell me some more. Because I'm going to get you 300 years in prison. Come here. Tell me some more. Write about. Come on. I'm your friend. Write it right here. I know, man. I'm dead wrong. I shouldn't have. You got to be the stupidest. <sighs> Very entertaining, to say the least. So I'm about wrapped up there. I got to be back out there tonight and back out there again tomorrow night. And then I will be there again Friday. And we will be wrapping up the whole process with the new house. And I will be able to get back to a lot more videos. I'm going to walk y'all and show y'all. Y'all don't get to see the computer setup I've got. Y'all don't get to see nothing but me and the backdrop. So I'm going to do y'all a walkthrough of actually my studio. Like a, let's show you what goes on behind the scenes with Jay Williams. Let's live life and Jay Williams, I'm living life. Show you all that. So let's get to the purpose of today's video. Robberies, extortion, getting ran down on, getting stuff taken from you. The way it goes down, the nitty and the gritty. You will see guys get hurt. You will see the, the alphas and you're going to see the betas. You're going to see the men that truly are lions. And then you're going to see the hyenas that wish they were lions, that act like they're lions. And then when the lions show up or they run face to face with a real lion, well, they realize they're a violent creature also. But you're just a hyena. You're not a lion. And then you're going to see the prey. The prey can be big and jacked up. Small and skinny. White, black, green, yellow, blue, pink, purple. It does not matter. Violence does not discriminate. Especially when it's you versus an entire group of, of guys. I've been in situations where I had to face a whole group of guys. And I know that I've got years left to do. I know that no matter what happens with this situation, I've got to address it. I can't fold up. I can't get all scary. I can't run from it. Because no matter what happens, I've still got years left to do. So the most I can do is swell up, let them know what it is, invite it, come on, let's go. Let them bank me or run the one-on-one -on -one if one of them steps up and they'll let me get the fair one, run the fair one with them. But no matter what, you got to stand 10 toes down. And when you don't, that will follow you the remainder of your bed. 
The moment you let somebody take something from you or people put hands on you or talk to you any type of way, you have just set the pace for the rest of your time incarcerated. That's why I tell you guys, I don't promote violence, but I do promote you standing up for yourself. You need to stand up for yourself, stick up for yourself. Don't let these guys talk to you crazy. Don't let these guys take things from you. Don't let these guys intimidate you and threaten you. So what if they're in a the gang? So what? What's the worst that's going to happen? You're going to get beat up? At least have some dignity. Have some pride. Go down swinging. Take one of them with you. That's what I would always do. Every single time, if I know I'm about to take an L, I'm going to grab one of you, and I'm going to focus on you. I know they're going to hurt me. I know they're going to swing on me and hit me from the back and punch me in the sides of my face and hook around me and kick me. But while they're doing that, I'm going to take all that out on you. I'm going to mount you, and I'm going to take every single last one of those hits, and I'm going to redirect it into the pressure I apply into my punches directly aimed at your face. But I've seen a lot of guys get robbed. A lot of guys get their stuff taken. And it's usually... I have seen a lot of different situations where it was one guy that was built like that when he got it on his own. But it's usually a group of guys when it comes to the robbery. Usually it's two or more that are going to run up on you. You always got to have a lookout to make sure nobody, if you got homeboys, they ain't coming to your aid. And mostly important to make sure no guards come in and catch you in the middle of the act. That's what we're doing today. Robberies and extortions. Getting stuff taken from you when it always ends bad. <laughs> As I've told y'all, I'm tired, so bear with me. But even though I'm tired, y'all already know the marathon continues. <sighs> with all that being said, you know how to seen it. You know how to lived it. So let's relive it. I ran into a guy the other day at Lowe's, a guy by the name of Frank that had just gotten out of prison here in VA. And the guy helped me load materials on the back of my truck. Guys will do that. They, they do it without you asking, hoping that you'll throw them a couple dollars. And I did. I, th I threw Frank a 20 spot. But he helped me load his lumber. And I was looking at his tattoos. And I could tell a convict when I see one. And he had a backpack on. I said, where'd you come home from? And he told me. I said, how long you been out? He said, five days. He said, my home plan was to my brother's house. Now, your home plan is... You have to have a place set up to go home to. Prisons do not just release guys out to society without knowing they have somewhere to go. Because they don't want just the guy that had all his crazy charges walking down the street looking for a car to sleep in. So he said my home plan was to my brother's house. That got approved. Probation had been by there. They released me. He said right before I got released, my brother got popped with a gun. So he's in jail. So I have nowhere to go home to. I have no home. I'm homeless. I got this backpack on. We got to talking about prison and everything going on in there. And he was like, man, the suboxone in prison has gotten crazy. I said, it wasn't really a thing when I was in there. I left in 2014. And I guess that's when that stuff really got popular. He's like, now? And y'all are not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. He was like, where I was at, he was like, he was going $1,000 a strip. He was like, actually, it was 1200 but if you bought three, you get them $1,000 a piece. $1,000 for something that sells on the streets for anywhere between $5 to $10 a piece. $1,000 a piece. Right hand to God. That's what the man said. You take something out here that's a very small amount of whatever it is. Tobacco, weed, yak, whatever you want it to be. And you put it into the system, the inflation on it is a hundred times, if not more, than what it should be. One of the biggest sellers in the penitentiary. I'm going to give you all five seconds to guess what it is. Boom, 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 boom. You ready? Tobacco. Yes. Tobacco was one of the biggest sellers in U.S. jails, penitentiary, state, federal, men's, women's, you name it. I was in prison in 2010 when they took smoking out of prison. Let me tell you, you can already guess. It was a very, 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 very bad time to be locked up. They said, if you've got it, 
you've got until February, February 1st, to have smoked it, flushed it, or whatever. But as of December, we will no longer be selling it. And come February 1st, it will be against DOC rules. You will get a charge. Prior to that, you go right to the canteen and buy Newports, Marlboros, generic cigarettes. Most people smoke loose tobacco, meaning like you would roll a joint, you would roll your own cigarettes. 99% of the inmates roll their own cigarettes because a pack of Newports unopened, that's gold. If you owe somebody money, you can put 10 packs of cigarettes on you, go out on the yard, and at the time they were five sixty-seven a pack, you go out on the yard and pay your debt. If you wanted to buy something for somebody, them cigarettes, they add up fast. You could buy it. So majority of guys smoked rolled cigarettes, non-filtered. It's serious. But once they took smoking out, the assaults that followed, the robberies, the... The rundown game was serious. I seen guys get attacked that were doing nothing. Had their back turned and thought they were minding their business. Walking the track. Hitting that cigarette. Got it cuffed in their hand. Hitting it. Thinking nobody sees them. And next thing you know, boom. Somebody snuff them. Slide them in the dirt. And walk up and pick the cigarette up. And walk off hitting it. Run their pockets. Check their socks. Take anything they had left on them. I've seen whole squads of dudes run up in cells because they smelled smoke coming out that cell. And guys will wait until we lock down and smoke because you don't want to smoke when everybody's running around because if nobody smokes and you're in a non-smoking facility, a cigarette will stink up the entire room. You can be 200 feet that way and you're going to smell it. But I remember seeing a dude that he waited till we locked down and I smelled it as well. The vents circulate air. They don't push no heat or no, no cold air, but it circulates air. As you smoke, one vent sucks, the other vent blows. All these different cells are smelling the cigarette smoke. And I hear the guys yelling through the vent, hey, yo, who got it? Who got it? They stop playing with me. Hey, sell me a little bit. I know you hear me. Who is it? So then they start yelling because you know who's on your vent line. Your vent line being the cells that are connected to the same vent as you that if you yell in, can hear. And it's four floors, so it's two, four, six, eight, eight cells on that vent line. You know who's on your vent line. You know who lives in every one of them cells. So they start yelling through the cell, through the vent. Hey, yo, sound off. Hey, that's you? Nah, it ain't me. Hey, Jay, sound off. That's you? Nah, it ain't me. Hey, yo, twin, sound off. That's you? Nah, it ain't me. And they get to one door. Hey, yo, sound off. That's you? Hey, yo, yo, yo. I say, hey, sound off. That's you? They don't get no response. The guards would come through, do their count. Somebody's smoking in here. Don't get shook down. Don't get the, don't get the pile locked down. Stop that, that, stop that foolishness now. And they roll on out. Once again, I hear the vent. Hey, yo, sound off. Jay, Jay that ain't you? Man, I told y'all it ain't me. You smell it? Man, I don't know what you got going on, but it ain't me. I'm not going to deny or say I do, you know what I mean? But I'm not trying to get in the middle of what's going on, say I do or don't smell anything, because I know what y'all about to do. Them doors pop. I come out of my cell, head towards the, there's a hot pot, we call it a hot pot. You get hot water, it's right next to the phones, the microwave. Head to get my water, I look up on the top tier, the cells above me, and both those cells have come out, and those four guys are standing there talking. And in the cell next to me is two white guys, and they were, 100% smoking. I could smell the smoke coming through my vent. As I was standing at my door, I could smell the smoke coming from their cell. I look up on the top tier and I see the four dudes congregating. I know what time it is. I go to my cell, I get my knife, tuck it in the front of my pants because they might think I was lying and run up in my cell. But I watch. And they come down the staircase. Two of them stand at the front of the staircase watching for the guards while the other two run up in the cell. And you hear the do, 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 do. And you do, I ain't got nothing. Do, 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 do. And they would commence to beating him up. His cellmates out in the pod wandering around with his earbuds in, sees what's going on. He ain't going nowhere near over there. Scary as hell. Stays far away from that cell. And after about two, three minutes of the guys, one of them beating him up, another guy searching and rummaging, they found what they were looking for. 
half a bag of tobacco, a lighter, a pack of rolling papers. And you seen dude come out with a ball up under his arm and went straight up to a cell and all four of them, shoo, shoot to that cell and they gap it up, split it up. Probably about, I'd say probably about three ounces is what it would end up being if you broke a bag in half. They not only robbed that man, they beat him all types of up. This is an older, older gentleman they beat up. Roughed him up, beat him up, left the purple marks, the yellow marks, the green marks, the black marks, the little knots, the big knots, the knots on knots on knots, racks on racks on racks on his face behind that tobacco. Guys know for the most who they can and who they can't try. Sad as this is going to sound, the old guys were the ones that were victimized the most. The old, old guys or the really young guys that stood off by themselves, that had no group, that had no friends. It was a bad time to be either or. Now, not all these old guys are defined by their age. They, a lot of these guys are defined by the things they do. You look at that man and what do you see? You see an old man, someone who's out of shape, someone who's probably been down a very long time. And that's kind of what you define him as. But what you don't realize is that he's been down for a very long time for a reason. He kills people. He's taking lives. Lives, plural, not singular for y'all that don't know what that means. He is a killer. Now here you come. I think you're gonna run over there and take something from him. The man has been in the prison system since the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. When prison was still prison. When men were still men. Before you could join a gang and have a whole bunch of guys back you, no, it was just men. Each man standing on his own. Each man and what he put in as far as how work goes and putting in work to find who he was. But these dudes did try the old guys. And some of these guys had gotten old to the point that they couldn't defend themselves like they once could. Remember this, when they give you a life sentence, you will stay there until the day that you die. Until the day that they put you in a bag, zip you up, and haul you up out of there. Whether it be at 65 or 106, a life sentence is a life sentence. You're never coming home. Think about that the next time you go out and you, you commit a crime. Never going home. No bond. No more court. No more appeals. No possibility that you will ever go back out to the free world. You will never drive a car again. You will never unlock your front door. You'll never own a refrigerator, never have a dog, never lay down with a woman. You're never going to do any of that again. You look around you at the chaos around you, at all these men coming and going. Guards telling you what to do, when to sleep, eat. To... That is your life until the day that you die. Now, they tried this with a bunch of the older guys. They did rob and extort a lot of the older guys. But some of these dudes weren't having it. Even at 65 years old, some of these guys still had six packs. At 70 years old, some of these guys are still lifting weights, still doing pull-ups, staying war ready because they're aware of where they are. But that was their target, was the older men. They tried to rob Killer. First of all, let's backtrack. The man's name is Killer. I wonder how he got his nickname. How do you get a nickname like Killer. From being good at playing cards? No, no, they probably call you Ace or Spade or something. From working on car, no, they probably call you Oil Pan or Mechanic. You get a name like Killer from either being a goofy that names himself that or from being just that, a killer. They tried this with Killer. Dudes ran up in there and they didn't stay in there long. We watched them mashed up. This I never understood. I'm going to give you all another story after this about the whole mask thing. I watched these guys go down to this one cell. All the, You got the middle staircase, then you got the back staircase. I lived in the back, right underneath the back staircase. Then you got the middle staircase where there's cells and it's like an L shape. Well, that, the guard in the booth can't see through that staircase to those cells. And I watched these guys congregate down there. And Killer lived midway down between the two, between me and them. I watched these dudes go down to this cell and the staircase congregate go in the cell and everybody heads off to chow and you see killer standing in his doorway we could still smoke at this time this is like january the february is coming up and the robbery has already started because they stopped selling in december so guys are already out of tobacco store boxes guys with tobacco are not letting it go this is the last time i'm gonna be able to smoke like i guess you could say legally i'm not giving that to you 
There was no chance you could get it from anybody. And guys were waiting until it was 100% gone before they broke out their stash and started selling it. But these guys waited. And everybody's going to chow. And you see Killer standing in his doorway smoking his cigarette. This is the same guy I told you that came out with the racist rant and his underwear calling people the N-word with the hard R on it. Like, this old man was crazy. He's standing in his doorway smoking his cigarette. Everybody's going to chow. And I looked down there. I didn't go to chow. A bunch of different people didn't go to chow. Certain meals you're just not going to eat because they're not edible. You have to be really hungry to eat some of the stuff. And I looked down there and you got these gang dudes mobbed up at the cell. And they're not doing, it's not like they're intelligent enough to like go in the cell or go to another area where nobody can see what they're doing. But they're standing in front of the cell with their back turned to us. And you can see them tying shirts around their face. And as the guards got her back turned, watching everybody exit out to, to go to chow, these dudes make their move. Boom. They run down the set of cells and past all the cell doors and they bust the left up in the killer cell where killer's at. Killer stood right there in the doorway smoking that cigarette, looked down and watched them. Tie these shirts around their face, trying to disguise themselves. I went over to his bama, pulled his poker out, put it in front of his pants, went right back to his doorway and stood there smoking his roll up. Look at these dummies. Thinking they're going to come down here. They probably think they're going to come rob me. I got something for them. Killer backed up into his cell, shut the door. Killer sitting in there on the bunk. He knows what time it is. As he's sitting there watching his TV, his door slides open. The only reason his door would be open is because he got it open or his cellmate got it open or somebody else got it open to come in there. I didn't see Killer. I'm down in my doorway. But I did see the dudes run up in his cell. And no sooner they ran in his cell, I heard, ah, ah, and they started running back out. Now, as they're running down to the other end, I'm standing there looking at this. I'm like, this shit is crazy. Like, <laughs> what have I done to my life? But these young dudes go running out of the cell, headed back to the direction they came. And the one dude's got three big red spots on his back. Where when they came in there, Killer pulled out on him. And when they attempted to run, he just started sticking them. You know what they did about it? Nothing. These little dudes end up getting violated. I've told you about violations before. That's when the leader of the gang decides you've done something wrong. Goes against the rules, the policies, the conduct that y'all have. And that means you get mobbed down on and stomped out by your own. So the boy got stabbed, stuck three times. They run back down there empty-handed. I'm sure they had knives on them, but they weren't killers. They weren't really trying to take it to where a killer was going to take it. They went down there hoping to intimidate this man, ran into that man's cell, and he stuck that boy in the back three times. And then they ran back down there and uncovered their face. Let me see. I watched them all stand down there panicking. Oh, man, you got to go to the doc, man. He stuck. Oh, man. What are we going to do? They weren't supposed to be doing this to begin with. They hadn't been given no green light to go rob this old man. They hadn't been told by the big homie they could do any of this. This was something, some crash mission. These little three or four dudes concocted and put together that they was going to go on. They was going to go rob that old man. Yeah, they got what they were looking for, right? Boy, got stuck three times. I'd love to hear what he tells everybody about the three stab wounds in his back and how they got them. Man, we ran up on a, on a white dude, probably about 260, 280 pounds. Big heavy set white dude named Killer. Yeah, man, we got the trading punches and we started stick. No, that's not what happened. You tried to rob that man some tobacco and because he stabbed you in the back, what's that tell you? You were running away and he stuck you three times in your back and you got nothing. And then you went outside after the big homie found out and all of y'all got violated. The end. It's raining like crazy outside right now. We'll give y'all one more before we get out of here. So I spoke on Bubba Licious in the past, a.k.a. Bubba. Bubba was a white guy, probably early 40s. Wore these round glasses, pink frames, like the, like the glasses John Lennon wore. Bubba was a gump. We called him Bubba, Bubba Licious, Bubba Gump, ironically enough. Bubba Gump Shrimp Company. That's a household name. These are the nicknames this guy had. Bubba had the dirtiest teeth in the world. When they, he used to be really, really skinny. Then when they took smoking out of prison, Bubba got really, really fat. Anybody you ever seen somebody that smoked, that quit smoking, that put on a lot of weight? That was Bubba. Long after they took smoking out of prison, Bubba continued to smoke. Bubba has since died. Rest in peace to Bubba Licious. Long after they took smoking out of prison, Bubba was still smoking. Bubba was also a hustle man. He was very similar to jingling in the way he hustled. Ironically enough, becoming gay from an incident that took place with jingling. I told that story also.
But Bubba continued to smoke. Months have gone by. Tobacco is getting scarce. They have now completely shut it out the prison. If you get caught with it, you get rid of it. Guys are going to the hole. The robberies are insane. Robbery is an everyday thing. Stealing is an everyday thing. These guys are brave. They're going and stealing from guys that they know 100%. If he finds out you're the one that went his cell, he's going to take you up out of here. Stealing from a man in prison is grounds to get you extra all the way out. That's a no-no. You take it. That's one thing. Let it be known. You took it. Even though that's a despicable thing to do also, prison rules state that's okay. But being a little thief in the night, not okay. Bubba's continuing to smoke. Nobody's really applied pressure to Bubba because well, Bubba's playing fair. Bubba plays middleman for all the dudes that are selling tobacco, that do have tobacco. So as far as getting the best deal, Bubba's a guy you want to deal with. Bubba deals with everybody. Bubba deals with the white dudes, the black dudes, the gangs, the gay guys. If you're locked up and you want a tobacco, at some point or another, you're going to have to go through the bubble. It's now gotten to a point where the guys that do have it are no longer selling it. They've all agreed. Like, this is one of the few times I've seen any, like, unity. But these guys have pretty much come in an agreement that you stop selling yours, I'm going to stop selling mine. We'll wait four or five months, and then we'll break out the packs. This is what we're going to charge. Agreed? So you had certain guys, not all of them, but in my pod in general, you had guys that agreed that no matter what, we'll smoke, but we ain't breaking bread with nobody else. These dudes are built like that. These dudes will take you up out. These are the type of men that if you take something from, if you steal from them, if you attempt to rob them, you're going to have to do them in the cell because they're not going to let it go. They're going to come after you, each and every one of you, and they're going to mow you down. They're going to leave you laying wherever you were when they found you. So you don't mess with these dudes. You leave them alone. They've built their name, their name in the streets. And the name in the streets sometimes is, uh, okay. But the name you build for yourself while you're locked up will supersede you. It travels a long way. If you're somebody's slap around, somebody's, somebody's do boy, somebody's jizzle, that's what you're going to be known as from that moment forward. But if you're known as a dude that puts in work, if you're known as a dude that's going to push that blade and does not care, especially with these guys that are doing life, natural life sentence, never coming home. Not a man you want to take anything from or apply any pressure on. Back to the story. These guys have come in agreement that they're not going to sell tobacco anymore. But Bubba is still smoking. At this point, there are very few guys that are able to smoke. You can't really find tobacco like that. I start hearing little rumors. I hear little dudes saying little things. Uh, look, he always smells like cigarettes. He thinks he thinks he's slick. Thinks, and people know. They know he's smoking, right? We're going to get him. More and more time passes. Bubba is continuing to smoke. This little group of dudes, little gang dudes again, they plot and plan on what they're going to do. At the time, Bubba's in the cell with an old man named Grandma. And Grandma looks like Herbert from Family Guy. 100% but talks like a grandma really skinny tall old man very very old has all since passed away that's who he's in a cell with so he has no grandma is going to sit on the bunk and continue sewing when they run up in the cell they devise this plan that they're going to run up in the cell and Bubba's cell is not far from the control booth I think he was in cell 7 or 8 at the time so he's maybe maybe 30 feet 35 feet from the control booth where the officer sits dead winter it's freezing outside we don't get no wreck so the pod is crowded there's people moving all around you 86 men stuck inside this pod all day long things gonna get chaotic the wreck is in place so we can get away from each other work is in place so we can get away from each other it's not good whenever we're all just crammed in there all day stuff's gonna pop off whenever we get like this fights will jump off robberies will jump off the robbers were jumping off seven days a week either way because guys still had tobacco and weren't playing fair. They run up in Bubba's cell. Bubba's not the fighting type. Bubba is 100% going to curl up and give it up. Give everything up. Came back to Bubba had HIV. So I hope anybody that took that. By now I'm pretty sure you figured that out. They run up in Bubba's cell. Beat Bubba all types up. Bubba's telling him I ain't got nothing. I ain't got nothing. I ain't got nothing. Finally he comes up off of it. Tells him where it's at. They go back to beating Bubba up. Bubba had tobacco, but Bubba didn't have the tobacco 
that everybody thought he had. Bubba had been going to the guys that chewed, dipped, any type of oral tobacco. Like, you know, guys will get a big chaw, a big cheek full of chewing tobacco. Well, when they're done with it, what are you going to do with it? They spit it out. Guys would dip. What are you going to do with it? You're going to spit it out. Dip and you could chew and it didn't put off no smell and the guards wouldn't know and it would, get, it would kill the craving for the nicotine. Bubba had a contract with everybody he knew that dipped. Everybody he knew that chewed tobacco on their chewed and dipped tobacco leftovers. He would then take it, put it in a napkin and microwave it. And then he would smoke it. So these boys got the stash, but the stash ended up being a whole bunch of chewed up and dipped tobacco that he had dried out. They beat him up under the just, a, I guess, the frustration of thinking they had hit a lick. They just knew they struck. They knew they was going to get all this tobacco, and they ended up getting a napkin full of wet, chewed up tobacco. Some of it had already been microwaved, and some of it had not. Here's the kicker. They smoked it. Lots of guys were smoking it chewed up tobacco they sold it it's not even the same it didn't even smell the same it smelled like like burnt bark off a tree but them dudes damn sure smoked it but they didn't kick Bubba's ass once they kicked it twice they kicked it once just to get him to tell what a stash was and then when they figured out what is this what is this Bubba what have you been smoking like they went back to beating him up. It's hard times and desperate measures when men are smoking other men's chewed tobacco. But I put it on my kids. 100% true story. 100% happened. And they 100% continued to smoke it after finding out what it was. To say that when they took smoking out of prison was chaotic is an understatement. Chaos doesn't even really capture what ensued afterwards. It was just insanity. You had guys that it was part of their daily routine. They lived, breathed, woke up just to that cup of coffee and that cigarette. It was all they really had left. You just strip men of everything they can have that actually makes them a man, which is a wife, a partner, a woman, the presence of their children. Their home, their automobiles, their job, that old dog, that favorite spot you go fishing at. All the things that define you and what you like in life are gone. So the few pleasures that men had left were very little. Smoking being at the very top of the list. If you had to take a vote, all right, we're going to take one off the list. Coffee or cigarettes? I can promise you coffee would have left and the guys would have kept the tobacco. But in taking it out... I did. I did think that we were going to come together and just destroy the penitentiary. We'll tear it down and we'll, we'll wreck so much chaos in here. They won't have no choice but to put it back on. That never happened. Guards were attacked. Guards were knocked out. I've done stories on that too. Standing on the side of the building. Thank you, Slick. You're going to pull out that Newport 100 and fire it up in the cut. You ain't supposed to be smoking inside the prison. Guards weren't allowed to smoke either. Caught old boy on the side of the building, slipping her, lumped him up and took his whole pack. This is a CO, a correction officer, a guard, an employee of the Department of Corrections got lumped up and laid on the side of the building behind a cigarette. And they ran his pockets. You know things are going hard and it's thugged out when they're knocking guards out and going in their pockets. I just stood back day in and day out and watched it unfold. Robbery after robbery after robbery. Assault after assault after assault. Didn't matter where it was. If you were caught slipping, you were caught smoking, they caught you lacking, it was going down right then and right there. Guys would wait till 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and smoke, trying to blow it out their window so you couldn't smell it in the vent line, trying to blow the smoke in the toilet and flushing the toilet a hundred times. People, please listen to my stories. Even though they're entertaining and there's that aspect of it, there's a lesson in everything, even a bullet. Get the lesson that comes with these. The moral to all of these stories is you can live that life through my stories, through my eyes. You can walk in my shoes without ever walking in my shoes. Every one of these stories should be what keeps you from going out here and doing something stupid. Prisons will never go away. Bad people will never go away. They just lock them up. You don't know what bad is until that becomes your life day in and day out. 
My last sentence was 3,650 days. And I had some time taxed onto that because I didn't know how to act while I was locked up. I can't believe I gave my life away for nothing. That's over 10,000 meals served. 3,650 days just on the 10-year sentence and for nothing. I didn't have anybody that I looked up to that told me to stop. I didn't have anybody that I idolized that said, Jay, stop. You don't have to be like me. Listen. And if you don't listen, I promise you this. Once you get locked up, and you start seeing the things I saw, you're going to remember me. And you're going to remember my stories. And in that moment there, you're going to wish you had listened. But anyways, these jails, the detention centers, these prisons, these facilities, they're all just crazier worlds than an already crazy world we live in. And as always, y'all know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? And like always, this is... J. Williams, let's live life. It's all my real ones. And there are some real ones out there. Because y'all still watching me. And y'all know how we do. Salute.